Hello, class. Welcome to the first lecture of two on blood. So introduce it today, talk about red blood cells, get into white blood cells. And we'll leave topics like coagulation and some other things for in person. <clears throat> so let's get right to it. And really, what's more important, what signifies life more than your blood, right? Um, it courses through your body. Blood loss, you know, is something that's uh, critical. Uh, will cause death if it's too serious. There we go. All right, so blood, when we talked about connective tissues early on, we mentioned blood as being one of those. And if in the body, in animals, there's four kinds of tissues. Epithelial, remember that, skin, cuboidal, squamous, columnar cells. And then nervous tissue, neurons, neuroglial cells. And then uh, muscular tissue, smooth, skeletal, cardiac muscle. And then there was that garbage can that everything else was thrown into, connective tissue. Includes things like fat and bone and tendons and ligaments and cartilage and blood. And one thing they all have in common is that they all have cells, chondrocytes, osteocytes, right, fibroblasts, and other kinds of connective tissue. And they all have fibers. Talked a lot about collagen and elastic fibers. And they all have a matrix, some kind of matrix. If you remember in cartilage, it was a rubbery kind of matrix. Bone, it was a crystalline matrix. Um, and here in blood, it's the matrix. matrix is fluid, it's plasma. So this yellowish fluid, viscous kind of uh, fluid is uh, what surrounds the cells. And the cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Say to yourself, what about the fibers? You have not mentioned fibers. Where are the fibers? Well, it turns out the fibers are not visible until clotting happens. So you have in the blood proteins, uh, fibrinogen and um, proteins that uh, are, are uh, dissolve in the plasma, but then under certain chemical conditions, they link together into these fibers, this sticky mesh that will clog up uh, a leak in a capillary or something like that. So pretty cool. The cells are the, like I said, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets are fragments of cells. And then uh, the, the matrix is the, the fluid, you know, half of blood volume is this yellow plasma. And then the fibers are hidden, uh, but they will appear uh, in certain chemical conditions. And this blood is, is uh, liquid and it's pumped through your body by the heart, which we will spend a lot of time talking about right after this exam. And uh, your blood pressure, of course, you know, if you were to cut an artery, it would, the pressure would shoot out, uh, the blood would shoot out, right? So you know it's under pressure, which forces it through every corner of your body. And what's blood going to do? <clears throat> it's going to We'll talk about the functions of it. Uh, I think what comes to mind right away is carrying oxygen to your muscles and tissues. All right, so how much blood do you have? Well, five liters. Oh, and, and I looked this up. In school, I have like two two-liter bottles and a one-liter bottle. But... Yes, this is about the volume of blood you have in your body. I did the math, if I did it right, it's about 14, 12 ounce cans. So that's what I was showing you. So on average, you have about five liters. And uh, if you're a big person, you may have six liters. And a small person, you may have four liters. So there's obviously a range there. And uh, your volume, like I say, the size that you are at. Uh, one big thing about volume is uh, your, how dehydrated you are, your hydration levels. So the more water you have in you, the more blood volume you have. And uh, my last lecture, endocrine system, we talked about how your volume of blood is really proportional to your blood pressure. Remember, a diuretic makes you pee, you get rid of that water, less blood volume, less blood pressure. It's important in health. So yeah, uh, if you're pregnant, you're holding a lot more, uh, you're gonna have more blood. Uh, the amount of fat, uh, muscle versus fat, when you look at that, um, uh, muscle holds a lot more water than fat. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, yeah, but you can quickly change your blood volume by drinking a lot or dehydrating yourself. That's really going to, how you can, you know, within hours or days, change your blood volume. 
Yeah, so about five liters. Think about that, that visual, how much you hold. And my question to you is how can you measure how much your blood volume is? Well, what comes to mind is you could just bleed yourself out, collect it in buckets and measure it, right? But okay, I should, I should make it clear. How do you measure your blood volume without killing yourself? All right, well, you guys think about that as scientists. I'll give you a cool idea. You can inject a small amount of uh, some substance that you don't break down. Let, your, let it mix in with your blood. So let your heart beat around your body and then take a sample of blood and look at the uh, percentage of that um, um, chemical in, in, in your blood then. So it dilutes out and you can do the math and figure out like what is the total volume. Yeah, kind of cool. And amazingly, you wonder how much blood can you lose and still live? Well, you know, if you lose a liter of blood or you know, how much, uh, if you bleed a lot, you're going to, um, your body will react quickly. It'll constrict your blood vessels or do whatever it can to keep, still keep your blood pressure sufficient to uh, let your heart and your, and your brain, you know, uh, get through it. But you can lose 40%, you know, if you look that up. That's amazing, right? Amazing, yeah. And once you're losing that much, your body has done everything that it can. And at that point, if you lose any more than that, you just don't have enough to pump and uh, um, you're not going to survive that. And interestingly, if you live uh, up and you move up to Denver, up in the mountains or something like that, um, you can see, look at almost two liters more if you live at high altitude. So you need more blood when you, um, there's less air pressure. So there's less oxygen available to you. All right, so what does blood do? First thing I think of is carries your oxygen to your cells, right? Carried in those red blood cells and nutrients. So it's gonna absorb things in your gut, water, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, uh, through the capillaries in your, in your gut, it's gonna go through your liver and back to your heart and it's gonna carry them throughout your body. And your lungs will take the oxygen in, they'll get rid of the carbon dioxide just through diffusion and they will pump it throughout your body. Very cool. Gets rid of waste, including carbon dioxide. Endocrine system, it is those Hormones are carried by the bloodstream, right? So another important thing. Um, and also it, it buffers. It turns out your pH of your blood has to be between, and thus your body, between 7.35 and 7.45 is a pH. So it's a little alkaline. And there's buffers, chemicals that will mitigate that. You know, you take in acids or bases and it will keep you just right by these chemical uh, buffers. And your temperature, I mean, the blood's all about that. You get in a hot tub, your skin gets red, and that is the blood vessels opening up in your skin. And then you can also sweat, and even without sweating, you can, that uh, heat can dissipate. And you go out a day like today, and uh, you turn pale because your blood is shunted to your core, right? So blood is involved in temperature regulation. Uh, and we'll get to the immune system. So that's how your white blood cells, your T cells, B cells, and neutrophils, all these things get carried whenever you have a cut or an infection. That's where they're, they're, these cells are made in your bone marrow, and then your heart pumps them through your blood to, to where they need to go. Woo! So if I convince you blood is important, not that you, you had any question, I think you knew that. And it's important medically, uh, we take blood samples, right? It's a common... Uh, thing you do in a, in a physical, um, because from it, we can learn so much about your health. We can look at all these different things and, and tell that. Urine samples too. We'll do both in the lab uh, this, this semester. You can tell some things too by urine, but blood's a little more direct. It's a little more invasive too, because you gotta, you know, puncture a, a vein to get it. All right, if you take blood out of your body, it's gonna clot, which means it's gonna clump up, you know, like cottage cheesy. Um, and that's normal. That's, it's, it's, that's good. It's, it's going to coagulate. And uh, what we want to do is if we want to test your blood to see what percentage, we call them the formed elements. These are the blood cells or the formed elements. What, what percentage is that? And what percentage is the plasma, which is the fluid? And um, this percentage is about 50-50, it turns out. And uh, we do this by doing a hematocrit or a crit. And uh, we'll do this in lab. Oh my God, tomorrow for some of you. Uh, we're gonna take a sample of your blood in a, in a narrow tube 
and uh, we're going to spin it in a centrifuge. And the heavier elements, the, the red blood cells and the cells will go to the bottom of the tube. And the lighter stuff, like the water, will stay at the top. And so it will separate it out into the somatocrit. And there's a little, it's called a buffy coat. It's almost, you often don't see it, but you may, if your eyes are good, see a little line there. And that's going to be uh, um, where, the, uh, where the white blood cells are in the platelets. There's not that many of them. All this red is the red blood cells. And this is some clay at the end. That white is a clay that you use to stop that into the, uh, this open tube. Yeah. So the hematocrit is going to be uh, uh, this division of what percentage of this. Uh, you take the amount of red blood cells divided by the whole thing, and that's your hematocrit value. And if it's high, that means maybe you're dehydrated. You've got lots of blood cells. If it's low, it means you're very hydrated. Or you could be anemic. You don't have enough blood cells, red blood cells, for various reasons. So it's very useful. You guys, you guys get blood. You, you take a physical. They want to know what's your hematocrit to tell if you are, usually to tell if you're anemic. You don't have enough red blood cells. So uh, this hematocrit, you can see it's slightly higher in men than women. Uh, men have more um, red blood cells per volume than women. Uh, you can ask me why it's it. Have greater muscle mass, less fat. There's there's differences between the sexes. That's that's one of them. Um, if your hematocrit is low, you're anemic, right? And uh, we'll talk a little more about that. But if you lose red blood cells, you become anemic. And of course, the issue is you become pale, um, tired because you need them to carry your your oxygen. All right. And so uh, this tube itself, since it's a glass tube, is lined with a anticoagulant, actually heparin, so that the blood doesn't clot up in this tube. So you can remove uh, blood from a body, and as long as the tubes are coated in anticoagulant, it won't clot. If you take some blood and put it in a glass, it's going to clot up. But you put some factors in there that we know keep it from clotting, it stays fluid. And so you can spin it and do the somatocrit. And now they have digital. You put it in a machine, gives you the digital readout. But this kind of cool, this old fashioned, just move it around and you can, you can read the hematocrit. Here it's a 45. All right, so hematocrit tells you the relative proportion in your blood of red blood cells. What about plasma? You can sell your plasma, you know. Um, it's not as easy. I was gonna say selling sperm or um, uh, giving a urine sample. They gotta hook you up to a machine with a big needle. What they do is they take the blood out of your body into a machine and then they spin it and they give you black your, your red blood cells and they keep the fluid. And so you're often sitting in a chair for an hour, uh, quite a long time while they, they do this. So big needle, you know, but you can make some cash uh, selling your plasma and they use it uh, and research and, and, and people that need those proteins in your plasma, they can, you can, you can sell that. All right, so what is plasma? It's the, the mostly water, 90, 92%. It just depends how hydrated you are. It's, but you can see plasma is mostly water. And in that is going to be electrolytes are going to be, you know, magnesium, potassium, calcium, sodium, things like that that dissolve there. And then very importantly are these proteins. And these proteins are important, um, have many functions. And uh, uh, indeed, there's a whole class of them. The, the most of them are for osmotic uh, pressure. They just make dissolved substances that are really important in your whole body and, and water movement between the blood and cells. It's going to move by osmosis. So by blood having a lot of dissolved proteins, the water out here is going to tend to be sucked back into the bloodstream because water is going to move from its higher to lower concentration. So it's going to move by osmosis. So a lot of plasma proteins, talk about this, are there simply to provide dissolved stuff so that water is going to move that direction. Yeah. And you also need uh, proteins in your plasma for transporting things that don't dissolve in water. Talked about uh, thyroid hormone or or lipids, they are fats. Fats and water don't dissolve. So they'll, they'll hitch a ride on these carrier molecules that, all, that do dissolve in water. And of course, your antibodies, those are proteins. 
in your plasma that are important, of course, in COVID times. And other proteins for clotting. I talked about how some will turn into uh, fibers in the right conditions. So plasma, mostly water, you know, uh, then it has inorganic salts, like, you know, your potassium and your sodium, things like that. Then a whole group of proteins that are important functions. And then also dissolve gases too, oxygen, carbon dioxide. All right, easily enough, there are three course classes of cells in your blood. The most obvious are the red blood cells. And we call them erythrocytes, so red cells. And they are filled with hemoglobin to transport oxygen. We will talk more about that. The white blood cells, you need to know they're called leukocytes, white cells. And uh, they are important for fighting infections and cleaning up debris. And lastly, the platelets. Um, called thrombocytes too, a thrombus is a clot. Um, these are little fragments of cells that are filled with chemicals involved in clotting. So preventing you from bleeding to death by stopping uh, cuts. And we'll do this blood smear. We'll have you put a drop of blood on a slide and then uh, see this slide? It looks like it's about a 30 degree angle there. And then you'll put it in the, put it right in the blood and then the blood will like, will attach to that glass and then push it forward to make this nice feathered edge here. And just so you know, the purpose is, is that if you look here in the microscope, it's too thick, you can't see anything, but it's just beautiful out here at the edges because the red blood cells are scattered apart. So you can look at them, count them and see them. And we'll stain it so you can see everything nicely and be able to look at your own blood on the microscope. Yeah, so looking at blood, take a sample. You can see it's not exactly 50-50, but about 45% uh, those formed elements, which would be the cells, and about 55% plasma, which is the fluid and things dissolved in it. And going beyond that, of the formed elements, Red blood cells, erythrocytes, make up 95% of them. So that's mostly what you see in a microscope. Red blood cells everywhere. Uh, white blood cells, you can see a, a fraction of a percent. And then uh, platelets, it looks like almost 5%, but they're really tiny. So they don't make a, take up much space. And then we're going to get to, and this will be the next lecture, looking at the different types of white blood cells. Yeah. And we'll talk about... When you look at the most common to rarest, you can talk about naughty little monkeys eat bananas. That's the order that you can help memorize from most common to least common. But these white blood cells have different functions for uh, uh, fighting uh, infections. All right, going back to the plasma, you can see it's mostly water, mostly water. Again, dissolved electrolytes. If you're going to work out and you need to take you know, sports drinks, it can help replace some of those that you sweat out. And then uh, it's going to carry wastes will be carried away in the blood, the nutrients, the hormones, vitamins, gases, of course, oxygen, carbon dioxide, important. Nitrogen's important in scuba diving, you know, in uh, great depths, and we talk about the bends and things like that, but yeah, anyway. Um, usually nitrogen's pretty neutral. It just dissolves and doesn't do anything. Um, and then the proteins, uh, you can see, we'll talk about the different kinds of proteins. All right, so that's blood big picture. And remember, you do a hematocrit, going to have, that's going to be the red blood cells, Whoop. and this is going to be the fluid above it, and that'll be your hematocrit. All right, where do we make all the blood cells are made in your bone marrow as an adult? And you guys out there, it's made in your bone marrow. And not all of your bones. Um, specifically, it's a lot of it in spongy bone. And so you see it particularly you guys are in the bone marrow registry, or have you ever had a bone marrow biopsy done? They usually go in the hip. So the hip has quite a bit, your sternum and your vertebrae, a lot of spongy bone, bones of the skull too. Um, and then the proximal parts of the long bones. So here at the, um, um, both the femur and the humerus at the proximal parts. You say to yourself, why not all your bones make blood cells? Because you don't need that much. So, Early on, like all your bones are working, but as you get older, most of your bone marrow is just fatty. So just remember, vertebrae, sternum is a good place to get a, 
a marrow um, sample because your bone is right underneath there, right? Big needle, you can almost just push it right in there. At the hip, you need a screw. It can be a little bit painful, but you can take out a sample there. All right. And we'll see red blood cells, they only last about 120 days, about four months, and you need to make new ones. Um, uh, white blood cells, some of those can last for years, um, indeed. And uh, platelets also, I'm not sure exactly how long they last, but these things are constantly remade. So every day you're making millions of new blood cells as the old ones are degraded and recycled. So let's see where they come from. Your bone marrow as an adult. And we're gonna see, we call these uh, cells in here pluripotent, which means that the potential, plural, to become several things. So these stem cells can become any one of those blood cells, red, all the five kinds of white blood cells or platelets, the same stem cell. Yeah. And so how the stem cell knows what to become depends on signals it gets. You know, do you need more red blood cells? You'll have this hormone EPO, make more red blood cells. Um, you have an uh, allergic reaction or a parasite, make more of these eosinophils, you know, right? Or a kind of a generalized infection, make more neutrophils. And so there's a signals that tell your bone marrow stem cells what to make. Yeah, and if you look above this, it would be uh, totipotent. Totipotent means totally potential, it can become anything. And those are the valuable stem cells early on, you know, when you look at it early in a fetus. And when you're a ball of cells, y'all know if you have an identical twin, you can separate those and they can become two different people, right? But pluripotent cells cannot become anything. You know, they, in this case, they can only become blood cells. They can't become fingernail cells, cartilage cells, bone cells. Um, so totipotent cells have the total potential in front of them. They could become anything. And these are stem cells, pure true stem cells. The one stem cells you find in your bone marrow are pluripotent, plural. They can become several things. And I still think it's pretty cool that the same stem cell can become something so different you know, as a red blood cell, you know, versus a white blood cell. And if you get into this in more detail, you learn like all the steps, you know, how they can become everything, you know. Um, there's two main groups here. These, these lymphoid ones become your B and T cells, these lymphocytes. And these make antibodies and these have cell to cell combat. So important in fighting infection. Yeah. And then uh, the myeloid on that side of it, you're gonna have uh, um, the red blood cells and platelets and then the rest of the white blood cells. Yeah. So once you've hit here, you can no longer become one of these, right? But you can become any of these. All right, well, as an adult, you guys are making all your uh, blood cells, all the different types in your bone marrow. And remember those places I talked about, your sternum, the vertebrae, your hips. But early on, you didn't have a skeleton. You think about, you know, your first few months of, uh, of uh, development, right? So I want you to realize early on your yolk sac before, you, in the beginning, you're just a streak of a nervous system and a tube, a gut tube, right? But then your liver, your liver is real important uh, in the middle of pregnancy. It's going to produce it as the bones are developing. And you can see the bone marrow takes over. But I don't know if you guys noticed a little overlap here. It looks like the liver still can, can do it. And if you have serious bone marrow issues, your liver can step up and make some blood cells, but only in unusual circumstances. So you can see your liver and spleen too had a, had a role in making blood cells. But when you get towards birth, that's taken over and your bone marrow is the site of uh, blood cell production. Let's talk bone marrow. Uh, bone marrow, again, is in the spongy bone. Um, and in the middle of the bones, the hollow cavity, there's a lot of fat, a lot of fat. And then there's what we call hemo or hematopoietic tissue, poetic, like poetic, like a poem. And these are the um, this is the tissue that makes all those blood cells. It's where the stem cells are and all their derivatives. And we'll see in your bone marrow, you have a huge store of these neutrophils. And neutrophils are the most common white blood cell. And they have, they're what, what goes if you like cut your finger or get an infection or something uh, where your body rapidly sends the cavalry. That's your neutrophils. So you got a bunch in your bone marrow so that if you do have a quick infection, 
they can send out all these neutrophils. They're ready to go. Yeah, it's a beautiful view looking at this uh, picture here, this histological slide of uh, bone, uh, spongy bone with uh, hematopoietic tissue. So this is all going to be bone, these little spicules of bone and that spongy bone. And they see a lot of fat. A lot of fat in there. And it's those darkly stained areas here, all these cells that are the stem cells and the daughter cells of those stem cells that are your blood cells. You're making millions. all oh, every day you're making millions of these things. I can even notice if you take a look at this, I see these really big, huge cells. I'll just let you know, those are called mega karyocytes. And those are gonna make the platelets. They kind of kind of glom off of those. And they see a whole bunch of darkly stained cells. And these are the stem cells and their babies coming out. And as the cells are made, they mature, and then they'll, they'll leave the bone through the through veins and they'll go out to circulation. All right, what do you guys think? Your bone marrow. And you know things, we talk about leukemia, you can irradiate to kill all these stem cells if there's in fact cancerous ones and get a, a transplant where you get someone else's, hopefully a close relative's um, stem cells to try to make normal uh, cells. All right, so the last topic, we'll talk about red blood cells and then we'll introduce white blood cells. And then the next lecture, I'll get into them in more detail. So red blood cells, we're really gonna hit those now. There's a lot of them. There's about 5 million erythrocytes or red blood cells per milliliter. Yeah, a lot. And uh, they're shaped kind of like, I was going to say a donut, but they, they don't have a hole in the middle. It's just like pinched in the middle. And they don't have a nucleus. They're anucleate in, uh, in us mammals, reptiles and fish. They have nucleus in them. But we don't have nucleus in them. And what happens in development is that the nucleus is squirted out. It's just gotten rid of. And it just allows more room in there because the red blood cell is about a third hemoglobin. It's like packed with hemoglobin to carry oxygen because we're very expensive, us uh, mammals. And we need our blood cells to just hold as much hemoglobin to carry that oxygen to our tissues. I did the math. If a five liters of blood, so yeah, billions and billions of these red blood cells. And because they lack, they, they don't have a nucleus anymore. They don't got mitochondria. What does that mean? What does that mean to you about these cells? How can you live without a nucleus, a cell? Well, it means they can't repair themselves, right? There's no genes. And then, uh, wait, there's no mitochondria. means you're probably just doing glycolysis, right? You're not doing the whole cellular respiration. And that's pretty cool. So red blood cells carry oxygen, but they don't steal the product. Like you don't want a drug dealer that's a, that, that's a drug addict because they, they, they use the product. So I made a bad example, but you guys get it, right? So in this case, it carries the oxygen, but it's not going to use it up. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. But no nucleus, no genes to repair itself. So they don't last very long. Like I say, 120 uh, days and uh, they start uh, really going downhill. They lost that new blood cell smell and they're just... Um, not flexible anymore, and they're leaking, and you just get rid of them. So it's been found that by having this kind of shape gives you another 28% surface area. And again, surface area is important for diffusion of oxygen. So more hemoglobin towards the surface of that cell in order to uh, exchange gases in your lungs. Well, I'm kind of nerd out on you here, but um, red blood cells are called the histologic ruler meaning that in almost any histological slide of any part of your body, you see some blood cells because there's blood vessels everywhere, right? And we know they're about uh, seven to eight microns, seven and a half microns, let's say, right? So that means any tissue you look at, you know that this is seven and a half microns. So you wonder, hey, how big is this nucleus? And you can just compare, that looks like about, about 10 or 11, right? So that's what I mean, is that almost any tissue you can see red blood cells, and they don't vary in size, not big and small ones. So it's a really good kind of ruler to tell you to measure other things in the slide because you know how big that red blood cell is. Cool, huh? Look at this picture here. Um, you can see here's a red blood cell. Here's the capillary. So they just barely fit. This one has to go this way to get through it. So the capillaries, the blood is moving very slowly and single file. There can be a lot of diffusion 
and exchange. And those red blood cells, they, they can deform. Think about like one of those inner tubes that you take down the river, you know, it's, it's bendy. So it can get through little, where the capillaries, where they cross and come together. And uh, so they can squeeze through the smallest capillaries, which just have enough room for red blood cells to get through. Yeah, so lifespan, it's like about four months. And so you replace about 1% of your red blood cells every day. So you're making millions, millions and millions, right? Yeah. And so your body knows it's gonna destroy so many and has to make new in order to keep homeostasis. So the amount you destroy has to equal the amount you make or else your blood cells are gonna go up or down. Yeah. The hormone that's gonna stimulate you to make red blood cells is called erythropoietin or EPO in the business, EPO. So uh, we'll see where that's made, but that's gonna make you make more red blood cells. They travel, I think it's about 75,000 trips around your body, right back to your heart, about 700 miles. You may say, who's gonna change their car after 700 miles? But these are seven microns. So that's like, you know, a long way to go for that tiny little cell, right? So you guys should be impressed how long they last. These red blood cells, they wear out. They lose their flexibility. Like I say, they leak. And there are certain places in your body like a sponge. And those blood cells are forced to make it through this like caves and through this sponge. And on, on the sponge are macrophages, these big white blood cells that are feeling out the environment. And when they detect a red blood cell that can't make it through or is old and leaking, they will get it and destroy it. When you destroy a red blood cell, you recycle the parts. We're gonna see, it's got iron in it, you wanna recycle it. But so um, these uh, organs that destroy your red blood cells are gonna be mostly your spleen and also your liver and bone marrow. They all have these spongy-like interiors where blood cells are forced to, to transverse a uh, obstacle course. And if they can make it, they're, they get, they're allowed to go around. But if they can't make it, they're destroyed. Yeah. All right, let's talk hemoglobin. You know, I rarely wax poetically about chemistry and how much I love chemistry, you know. But um, in this case, it's kind of cool, all right? What it is, hemoglobin, it's made out of uh, four uh, chains, polypeptide chains, uh, that come together. It's its quantitary structure. I taught you guys that last semester. It has four chains that come together. And uh, the globin part and the heme part, nestled in the middle is this heme. And it's got iron. It's got freaking iron in the middle. You know? Rarely do we see in organic chemistry, you know, inorganic chemicals. Um, we'll see vitamin B12 has a cobalt in it. Um, oh, thyroid hormone has an iodine in it, and hemoglobin has an iron in it. Yeah, right. So the iron, uh, think about it like iron things rusting when it's out in oxygen. Same thing here, it, it's going to combine with oxygen. And what's important with this chemical reaction is that oxygen binds with the heme, the hemoglobin, but you don't want it to bind irreversibly because that would suck. You get the oxygen, it just travels around. You want it to let go of it in your tissues. So you need to have this binding that is tight enough to carry it to the tissues, but not tight enough that it doesn't release it when it gets there. So kind of cool. Oh, and what I was getting to is that this, this molecule shows cooperative binding, which means that when an oxygen binds to one of the hemes, it changes the shape of the molecule to make it more likely that oxygen binds to the others. Yeah. So it changes shape and it makes it more accessible for other oxygen. So that's pretty cool. All right, well, you guys probably know that arterial and venous blood looks a little different. Arterial blood is more bright red and venous blood, you can see the veins in your arm, it looks kind of blue. It's not really blue, it's kind of like, looks blue because it goes through these tissues, but it's darker. And you need to know the chemical name is oxyhemoglobin, is, our, is blood that is filled with oxygen oxyhemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin is deoxygenated blood. And really, it's got some oxygen, but it's not filled up. Let's just, let's just say that. So venous blood is darker than arterial blood. All right. 
you, your baby may have cyanosis or be cyanotic. And I remember it because there's a, there's a color in my crayon box, cyan blue. Yeah, so I know it's blue, cyan. So cyanosis is when you turn blue. And many, many causes of this, it's, it's, it's a lack of oxygen, oh, hypoxia. Remember, hypo is less oxygen. So if your tissues aren't getting enough oxygen, you're hypoxic and it shows up as cyanosis, this bluish color. And in the cold, your lips may turn blue, your fingernails, yeah? And so what happens in the cold is that, you know, blood is shunted away from your extremities. And so the blood's moving really slowly. So the tissues take out a lot of oxygen. So it appears blue. But you could have carbon monoxide poisoning. You could be uh, not getting enough oxygen because of lung problems and you'll be cyanotic or blue. And it's obviously an issue that they need to increase your blood oxygen levels. All right, take a look at this. You guys, I have confidence. I'm looking at my audience. I'm imagining you guys, all right? And I, I know some of you are like, oh, I know what this person has. This is a white blood cell, so don't worry, don't let that fool you. These little fragments are gonna be, uh, those are uh, platelets, ignore those. These are normal, cell. this is a normal looking red blood cell, but these, these guys, this is sickle cell anemia. I know some of you got it. You didn't say it out loud. Well, frankly, it'd be weird because you're probably by yourself. But um, sickle cell anemia is a disease that you studied in biology. God, I hope you all know exactly about sickle cell because we teach it in gen bio. It's just a, even in high school, it's really a cool thing, a cool example of biology. Um, yeah, we'll get it. I, I, I tend to want to keep teaching that, but I'll stop. So what it is, it's a genetic disease, sickle cell anemia, where you have one letter difference, one base pair mutation, freaking changes letters. And it causes a different amino acid to go on the protein hemoglobin. And it works fine sometimes, but in low oxygen levels, it tends to stick on itself and the blood cells will sickle. Looks like a, a sickle is a, like a knife to cut grass, like death holds a sickle. And that's an issue. Sickled blood cells, they don't travel through small capillaries. They bunch up and cause pain and hypoxia to tissues. And so under low oxygen conditions, hemoglobin that's not has the right amino acid is going to get a weird shape. Yeah. Now, I think you know sickle cell anemia. If you looked at the United States and who has it, you can see for 100,000 people, only about two. Uh, uh, Caucasians have it, but 300 African Americans. And you better know where this is going. Um, listen to me, if you, I feel bad if you don't, but I mean, in biology class, we learned that there's another disease called malaria. And malaria is a, it's actually a protozoan carried by mosquitoes. Um, most of the world, tropical world, you have to worry about it. it. Used to be in the US too, but we killed them off in TDT. But the deal is this the deal is the sickle cell allele, if you have one copy of it, you don't get malaria, which can kill you, right? If you get two copies of it, it could, it's gonna kill you. You have sickle cell. You don't live very long. Uh, there's therapies now, but you know, you just, it's not good to have sickle cell anemia. So, and, and if uh, you have no copies of the sickle cell allele, you get malaria. And in areas of the world, this shows where malaria really is. Um, these mosquitoes and malaria, you tend to see a high percentage of this allele. So it's a negative, a deleterious allele, the sickle allele, that is a benefit when you only have one copy because then you don't get malaria. Anyway, that's a story that I shouldn't be the first to tell you. <laughs> I don't think I am. All right. Uh, so if you uh, give a blood sample, we're not gonna do this one because we need special machinery. Yeah, right. but uh, you want to do a, a, a CBC, a complete blood count, or in this case, a red blood cell count. How many um, red blood cells do you have per milliliter, right? And I want you to know it's about five mil. And then I, the other thing I want you to know is that they're in, uh, in men, it's higher than in women, that it's higher in children. All right, but I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate these numbers, you know within 100,000, you know, so yeah. So men generally, higher red blood cell count, it's gonna translate into greater aerobic capacity, you know, and again, these are averages. Some women out there in, the, in this audience have higher red blood cell counts 
than men. But on average, this is what we see. And these machines account this, and it's you know it's an estimate, of course, and uh, you can use it to find out. You know, if you're you're really low, it's anemic. If you're really high, you could be blood doping, or you could have other issues. That uh, so these are typical ranges that we uh, we can look at when we order some tests to see to give us hints about your health. And the higher your red blood cell count, the more oxygen you can transport to your tissues. So if you're doing aerobic, you're running a marathon, you're biking across France, you want a high red blood cell count. Uh, but too high means your blood is viscous. It's thick like maple syrup. And that can cause heart attacks, uh, uh, strokes, issues that kill people when they try to increase their red blood cell count. So just overall, you guys destroy the same amount of red blood cells as you make. Right? You keep that balance. But if you were to move from Maine to Denver, there's less oxygen because there's less air pressure. And so you would be hypoxic. Your body would notice, damn, I'm not getting enough oxygen. And so this hormone EPO, erythropoietin, will be released mostly from your kidneys, uh, some from your liver, will be released into your bloodstream. And it travels to your bone marrow. And your bone marrow, when the stem cells get EPO, they make more red blood cells. Simple as that. And if you move to Denver after weeks and months, then you're gonna stabilize and your EPO levels will come back down and it'll be this negative this feedback mechanism. Yeah. If you move back to Maine, your EPO levels will drop and your blood cell level will come down. So you have this beautiful mechanism. Yeah. Cool, huh? All right, you guys got it? Okay, a couple other things that are important for your diets to make red blood cells. I mean, you need enough protein to make uh, amino acids to make the, the globin. But uh, um, iron, you guys know that, right? That uh, you need enough iron because it's needed in the heme of the hemoglobin, right? And uh, for some of you, don't get enough iron in your diets. Um, women are more um, iron deficient than men because they bleed menstrual blood. Whenever you lose blood out of your body, whatever kind of bleeding, you lose iron. Okay, if red blood cells are destroyed within your body, you tend to recycle it. And in the hospital world, GI bleeds, people that bleed into the GI and it just goes out in their feces uh, are losing blood. And so they will be anemic and, uh, and have issues there. So whenever you bleed, um, you need to take in more iron. And we get iron in our diet. If you have a good, a good diet, it's not absorbed that easily. Um, vitamin C helps you absorb iron. So. The book talks about drinking orange juice when you want to get more iron. And tea will bind with iron, the tannins, and it will make you not absorb as much. So some of you take iron supplements, mostly women, females in general. But uh, if you're anemic, you don't have enough hemoglobin because you're iron deficient. Two other things are some B vitamins, B12 and folic acid are needed. They're needed for um, uh, DNA synthesis and, and stem cells. Remember, you're making millions of red blood cells actively dividing. So they need these these two. And if you're deficient in either one, um, you'll be anemic too, because you can't make blood cells. When you make weirdly shaped ones, you have some issues. So folic acid, B12, you need those from your, absorb them from your diet. And then iron, you need that too. All right. Well, you can see I redacted a lot of these names of, uh, you can get into this big time if you want to learn how blood cells are, uh, how they develop. But for me, you have stem cells, and then I just want you to know, before you become a mature erythrocyte red blood cell, you, you make this reticulocyte. It has like a little netting inside. It just hasn't lost everything yet. And it's released into the bloodstream as a reticulocyte. And then within days, it turns into a erythrocyte. It loses that, that netting goes away. Who cares? Well, I want you to know, because it's a cool way that we can determine the rate of new blood cell production, red blood cell production. Because if you look at all the blood cells in a sample and you have just a lot of reticulocytes in proportion, that means you're producing blood cells who are rapidly, right? And if you have a normal amount, which we've determined, then you know oh, yeah, you're just replacing. And if you don't have many, it means you're not producing many red blood cells. So I just want you to know the final step before mature red blood cells are reticulocyte and has a little reticulated net in there. So we can use that as a marker 
of uh, how quickly blood cells are being produced, red blood cells. All right, so anemic. To be anemic, and some of you absolutely are anemic. I'm looking at 100 students percentage-wise. Some of you are anemic, right? And many are iron deficient anemic. So you need to get uh, more iron or make sure you're absorbing it in your diet, right? Um, and you know, sickle cell anemia. And that's caused because these sickle cells, you also destroy it really rapidly because they're weirdly shaped. So you destroy this. So you're always anemic if you uh, have sickle cell anemia. Often your spleen gets all gummed up. You gotta remove your spleen early on. So you're on antibiotics, um, yeah. Uh, pernicious anemia, pernicious means you're going to die. This is bad. Uh, if you don't have enough vitamin B12, you can't make red blood cells and uh, you need to get that vitamin B12. The vegans uh, have an issue. B12 is really animal sourced. You can get some fungi that can make it, but if you're completely, you know, not eating any animal products, that's the biggest issue is B12 among the vitamins, hard to get. Um, yeah. And then we'll talk about vitamins, but usually it's not there's enough of it in your diet. A normal diet has enough B12, but it's to absorb it, you need this intrinsic factor. You need this one factor that allows you to absorb it. People often don't have that. It's made by your stomach cells, but I'm just previewing a later topic. Cool. Um, and then you can have things like if you have radiation or chemicals could destroy your bone marrow. So aplastic anemia means that your uh, stem cells are destroyed in your bone marrow. Yeah. All right, cool. Oh, so big picture, anemia means either not enough red blood cells or not enough hemoglobin. So these blood cells look pale, don't they? So those are two things. You can take a, a red blood cell count or a hemoglobin count, how much hemoglobin per, per a milliliter of blood. And those are both useful, but usually correlated, but not always. So, all right, so if you're anemic, you don't have blood cells, not enough hemoglobin, so you're not carrying enough oxygen. So you're listless, pale, all right, here's got a big picture. You can take a look. To make blood cells, you need ingredients to make them, right? So you're hoping you get enough iron and the B12 and folic acid so that and it's absorbed in your bloodstream. And then it's gonna be carried to the bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, these parts that take into an assembly line, a factory, can be assembled into blood cells. And the blood cells are released into the bloodstream. Yeah, you make new blood cells. They're, they're, they're brand new. They got 120 days ahead of them, right? And when they get aged, they'll start being broken down by macrophages, mostly spleen, liver, bone marrow. They're broken down and uh, they'll be recycled. And uh, um, the globin part is the, the amino acids. Those are broken down amino acids you can use to make any kind of protein, right? And the heme has an iron and it has other chemicals. Uh, the iron will be recycled too. And your iron, <clears throat> your liver stores a lot of iron bound to this protein, so it's called ferritin, it's iron. So that's why when you look at, um, you know, what kind of foods to get certain vitamins, liver is always on there, right? But who likes liver? I kind of like, I like liver and onions, but it, not a lot of it. But so liver has a lot of iron in it because it stores iron as it does in your body, okay? And so, and then uh, uh, the globin part, um, no, I'm sorry, in the heme, the iron is recycled. And then uh, uh, the rest of the heme becomes uh, this biliverdin, which is green. I think of Spanish verde as green, maybe Italian, a lot of languages. So this green pigment, and that can be, uh, some of that's turned into bilirubin, which is kind of yellowish, orangish pigment. So this biliverdin and bilirubin are pigments of recycled blood and that goes into bile, this thick bile that's stored in your gallbladder that's used in digestion. Yeah. So that's the story. There's all kinds of cool things involved in that. And so the bile gets squirted into your intestines and it's helped, helps to digest fats. Yeah. All right, what do you guys think? Red blood cells are destroyed constantly and they're constantly made. And uh, you don't waste that iron. Although you always lose some iron. You always lose some. If you bleed, you lose a lot. Um, so you always have to take some in from your diet, but your body recycles a lot of it. Okay. So it recycles as much as it can, but you, um, you always have a constant loss of iron. So you need to get it from your diet. All right. These are just in words to help you study. You can read this over. All right. Well, if you guys want to do better, 
athletically, you want to run farther, you want to be able to work out longer, you can get more red blood cells. Well, the old fashioned way was you could bleed. You can spin down this blood and so you get the red blood cells. You can store it in your freezer in Tupperware, I presume, somewhere. And then before the competition, you can warm it up and inject it back into your blood. My God, don't do this, please. It sounds horrible, chance of infection, all kinds of horrible things, but that's been done. Um, but now we can do it easier than that. You simply need the hormone EPL, erythropoietin, and we have synthetic versions of it. And uh, this is what um, and then athletes will do to get an advantage. And it's illegal, of course, in most sports, but um, famously Lance Armstrong, uh, bicyclist. I think it's pretty clear that uh, he used EPO illegally to uh, help his performance. And uh, yeah. And so you, uh, you have it naturally in your body, EPO. So to, in order for sports organizations to catch this, they need to be smarter. You know, there's a cat and mouse game, but uh, uh, EPO, and it's useful EPO, of course, medically for people that are anemic and uh, it encourages red blood cell production. All right. So uh, this is a colorized picture, but anyway, you recognize the red blood cells. Here's a white blood cell, that fuzzy one. And then these little fragments are platelets. All right, Whew. long lecture here, but I will uh, finish. I'll, I'll give you the introduction to white blood cells and then I'll get into detail in the next lecture. So leukocytes are what you use to fight inf <laughs> infection and to get rid of debris and to clean things up. So you got these things like macrophages are called zooming through your lungs and eating the carbon. And, uh, when you destroy cells on purpose, they eat up the debris. And uh, oh, the red blood cells, when they're destroyed, macrophages will eat them up. And of course, foreign invaders like bacteria and virus infected cells like with COVID or cancer infected cells. So talking about numbers, remember how many red blood cells you have per milliliter? Five million, right? You've got like 5,000 to 10,000 uh, white blood cells. So much, 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 much fewer, right? And this can go up or down, you can have leukopenia, uh, you can have too many or too few of these, and it's an indication of uh, an issue. Um, and some, uh, some of these white blood cells uh, produce antibodies. We'll talk about that a lot. All right, and then looking at this, and I mentioned a mnemonic, this is uh, neutrophils are the most common, then lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils are the rarest. And you can remember naughty little monkeys eat bananas, if that's helpful. So neutrophils make up, you know, 70%. And these are the ones that I'll just talk about and then we'll end the lecture. They go and they, they fight most infections, right? And then um, lymphocytes, these are gonna be your B cells and T cells, your memory cells and your lymph nodes and Vicodin vaccines. These are the smart ones, they're really cool. And then monocytes, uh, these big ones here, they're gonna become those macrophages. They're gonna be big and they're gonna eat any bad guys, a lot of them. Eosinophils are these red ones, and they are important. They have a bunch of chemicals for allergic reactions or parasitic infections. And then basophils are the rarest, just so rare. And, uh, but they're going to be filled with chemicals, especially hip, heparin and histamine involved in uh, uh, your inflammatory response. Uh, they're going to make the blood vessels dilate and, and bring the other ones to the, to the, to the fight. And then again, I'm just introducing this, but when you look at all the white blood cells, there's five different types I want you to know. There's gonna be uh, two agranulocytes, it means without granules. So they're kind of clear, see the cytoplasm? And then three granulocytes, and they have granules in them filled with chemicals. Yep. And there's red blood cells here for scale. So you can see the monocyte is the biggest, right? Yep. And these are about the same size, all right? So we're going to get to these. Uh, we're going to get to uh, uh, what they all do. And uh, your body makes these, just like EPO is the hormone that makes you make red blood cells. White blood cells, you hear about interleukins and uh, colony, colony stimulating factors. So different, various different um, um, signaling molecules that tell your bone marrow, those uh, pluripotent cells, what to make. Dude, we need more... Uh, uh, neutrophils. Okay, we got it. All right, we need more cinephils. Okay, so they're listening for signals, these hormones that tell them which 
kind they should become, like putting in the order into your bone marrow, which do we need? So these granulocytes here, you can see they're bigger than the red blood cells. And then you see the purple, that's the nuclei. So unlike red blood cells, white blood cells have a nucleus. And they're not purple in real life. It's just the stains that we use. So they jump out at you, It'll make them look purple. Yeah. And so uh, they last, you can see on average, it depends on what it is, but you know, they last about less than a day. They'll make it through, they'll do their job. You're always making these things. And the neutrophils are the most common. And uh, they look like this. They have several, it's like a lobed nucleus. They have like several lobes, usually three to five little lobes inside of them. And they've got dots in them. So they got little granules you can see like that. And you can see they're bigger than a red blood cell. And so red blood cells will coat your slide when you look at it. And then the white blood cells will be mostly neutrophils. Um, like 60, 70% will be neutrophils. And their function are acute infections, which mean rapid infections. Chronic would be like a long-term disease. Acute means you've got an infection. You just got a splinter, something like that. Yeah. And so neutrophils, they're the first wave. They go towards an infection. And uh, they're going to go there. They're going to leave the bloodstream. They're going to go into the tissue and fight, eat the bacteria. And they can only eat a couple dozen. And then they blow up and turn into pus. So pus is going to be destroyed neutrophils, destroyed tissue, and uh, it's going to gather. And you know your neutrophils are working when you get that, that pus. And it feels red and inflamed and hot and painful. That's this inflammatory response. And the neutrophils have been called up, the cavalry. They're not very smart, but they eat anything that's foreign. So they're, ah, they're going to go eat and then they die. Yeah. Yeah. And they move. Uh, chemotaxis means they move towards the infection. They find the chemicals in infection or bacteria and they go towards that. And they'll also secrete chemicals causing your, you to have a fever if it's a serious infection. Yeah. And then you guys, a little nugget there, you can click on that and see that these things move. This is a picture of a neutrophil chasing a bacteria through your blood. That's pretty amusing. All right, and I, I swear, I think this is the last slide here. Um, let's say you have an infection, you have any bacteria. Well, there's gonna be a, a damaged tissue. All these substances will be given off, not only by the bacteria, but the cells are destroyed, give off these warning signals. And the nearby capillaries, there's capillaries everywhere, will uh, recognize that. And they'll send out these little adhesion molecules, these little sticky molecules. It's like putting it like when a, in a, a chase with a cop car, when they put down that spike strip and, the wheels burst. So in this case, you put out these sticky things and the neutrophils that were just taking a ride around your body all day long, they're going to suddenly stick to that and like, oh, I'm called into action. And then when a white blood cell leaves the bloodstream and goes into the tissues, it's called diapedesis. Diapedesis is a white blood cell leaving the bloodstream and going into tissue. And then it will follow the signal, chemotaxis, it will follow the chemicals and then it will fight the fight. It will eat as many as it can, blow up, turn to pus, but then more of them will come. And that's how your body hopefully gets the best, the upper hand on infections. You have enough neutrophils that come in there. Okay. So when we take a blood sample, you do a smear and lab of your own blood, you see white blood cells in the blood, they ain't doing much in the blood but they're gonna leave the blood and go into the tissues. And that's where they do the, their, their, most of the action. And here's a neutrophil. You can see this nucleus is lobed and it's bigger than a red blood cell. And here's a heart attack. So you take a heart attack and you get a sample, a biopsy, and you see all those purple things are neutrophils. They've rushed in. This is dead muscle tissue that they're gonna help uh, clean up. All right. That's it for this lecture. I've left the rest for in person. Um, and we'll talk about some of the cool things about blood include uh, uh, its ability to, uh, to, to uh, clog up leaks. Imagine your, your car if you had a, a leaking uh, coolant system. Instead of us having to go like fix it, it just it would fix itself, you know, so your body all these uh, arteries and veins in your body, um, they, if there's any kind of breach, you cut it, there's any kind of leak, it, it's going to fix itself. That's coagulation. So it's a cool system. Now, without it, it will bleed to death quickly, right? 
So we'll talk about coagulation and uh, talk more about your white blood cells and, and how they find infection. All right, you guys. Uh, hopefully you can listen to these lectures and, uh, and, and get something from it. And um, um, I'll see you all very soon.